there's a pride culture in Asian culture where you look really good to other people, but you treat your family like trash. It's like, oh, everything's great. I need to show other people how my life is totally... Yeah, exactly. And they're they're like, never tell people what's going on at home. That's so shameful. I remember my mom did that so much as a kid. And I was just like, why? It's the truth. And she hated me for that. Like, I was like, bro, that is a form of love, like understanding someone. Like, I think also you get into type, honestly, it's like the self-selection factor of like, you're even into type because you are so desperate to understand the world around you. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to do something a little different. We're going to talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart. I want to talk about uh, being Asian American or being Asian in America or Canada, in Joyce's case, being raised by Asian immigrant parents. Today I have the lovely Joyce from her channel, Joyce Meng, and the lovely Crystal from Crystal Duong, I think that's the name of your channel, right? Again, today we're just going to talk like real people talk about our experience and talk about how it has affected our childhood and how it's affecting our adulthood being raised with immigrant parents. Before we begin, I think a proper introduction is necessary. I'll start off. If you're new to my channel, my name is John. My ethnicity is Mien. A lot of people don't know what Mien is. Essentially, I'm a jungle Asian. For those of you who are in the Asian community, a jungle Asian typically means like Southeast Asian countries. Mien, originally from China, but got kicked out, eventually made it to Laos, got kicked out, made it to Vietnam, Vietnam War happened. Then my parents and my grandparents grew up in refugee camps in Thailand until we migrated to the United States. In this conversation, I represent the Asian people who are not scholastically represented. Most jungle Asians don't make it past high school. Most jungle Asians don't have a college degree. Most jungle Asians don't excel academically. That's my background. Crystal, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. So I'm Crystal. I also have a YouTube channel. I used to make videos with Megan Lavona, and now I just kind of do my own thing. And I'm an ENFP, and my background is I'm Chinese-American. My parents are basically both from the mainland. My dad's from Hunan. My mom's from Tianjin, Beijing. Uh, and yeah, I was born here because they came to the States in the 90s, and so I grew up in Oregon. I speak pretty fluent Mandarin relative to someone who actually hasn't really gone back a lot. My family is very disconnected from the mainland culture, even though they still like, you know, speak Chinese. We have a huge immigrant community growing up on the West Coast. So I do think a lot about um, being Asian. It's a big part of my identity and a big part of, honestly, the things I like to talk about. So yeah, it's definitely something that occupies my brain space and I'm excited to talk more about this. Hi, my name is Joyce and I run the YouTube channel Type Talks and it's where I interview people on the, their experience as their type in the 16 types. I am Chinese, my mother is Chinese, she's from Gonzhou, and my dad is Chinese and he's from Africa. So the locations vary, but the route is the same. Thank you both for a quick introduction. Crystal, thank you for reminding me. I forgot to tell everyone, if you're new to my channel, I am an INTJ. You have three intuitives talking about our experience being <laughs> raised by immigrant parents, which is going to be a little different from if we were censors, but I'm hoping to continue this series and have more people as a different type on the show so we can get a clear vision of how each type is affected by old traditions more than anything. The first thing that I want to talk about, and I'll open this up to you ladies first, what is your definition of an immigrant parent? Because immigrant parents can mean a lot of things. It could be a very personal thing, or it could be a more social, economic, or philosophical thing. Joyce, let's start with you first. What does it mean to have immigrant parents to you? When you have immigrant parents, they have social and cultural values that are different than where you're currently at. For instance, with my family, we don't actually celebrate any holidays. We just celebrate Lunar New Year. That's an immigrant behavior because it's from the overseas. It's like having a different lifestyle or cultural upbringing than people where you're at right now. My non-well articulated definition like the co the culture that you're raised in right like um the, the culture that they were raised in but then pushed upon you while you're being raised in a different culture is that what you're trying to say that is exactly what i'm trying to say yes <laughs> crystal what does having immigrant parents mean to you yeah i feel like we talked about like the definition of like immigrant parents which is like they come from a different country different country than the one they grew up in and they pass on values and I think that what it means to me, and when I think about that, the first 
salient thing that comes to mind is it's not just like generational cultural values your psychological composition as a child of immigrants completely shifts as a result Mm -hmm. because that clash and that tension that your parents feel from having to like the pressure to conform for better for worse and like the changes they have to make to adapt like even if they don't speak the native language and they like isolate themselves they're still exposed to the fact that they feel alien that creates an intense psychological clash within your siblings and they reacted very differently to having immigrant parents you guys are still raised by the same parents who are experiencing this and it's definitely like um it creates neuroticism inside of you that is going to be very different than someone that's has parents who've like fully acclimated and it's been a couple generations worth and that's what i think of a lot in that sense most like kids of immigrants we have to be more aware of like how our psychological needs aren't getting met and even if say you live like the dream american life like for for me like it's of immigrants who came here even if they live the american life they're still very aware of like what it's costing them and like where their place is and there's not a basically a sense of safety like even if your parents and you have a great relationship that clash and having to be a code switcher, especially if you are the child who is responsible for full assimilation because you were born here or you're like you came here as a toddler, it creates a different kind of pressure and burden. So I feel like it's actually pretty easy for me to spot white passing or like black passing. Children of immigrants in the US, I can kind of tell from their behavior how if their parents are actually like native English speakers and things like that. Yeah, and I think that because of the culture, Gosh, <laughs> I'm having a, a morning this morning. So, um, full transparency, if I am a little bit scrambled today, uh, I had a little bit of an immigrant clash with my parents. Since, since this is the topic of today, I thought I'd bring it up. They moved mm-hmm. everything in the house into my room today, and we had to film. So, right before then, I, I had to move everything out, and I'm like, this chaos, I was not expecting this. No privacy. And, and so, it, it goes to that theme of... Asian parents don't really have boundaries, so whatever is yours is theirs. And so with some Asian parents, they'll wear your clothes or they'll come into the room without asking you because they, they're like, you're, you're my property or you're mine, so you shouldn't care about this. There's no privacy here. There's just all of this is shared. <laughs> and, and so it creates this interesting psychological dimension because you, you will try to explain your situation to other people and they may not always understand. And so you deal with this intersectionality between being Asian and also being an immigrant too, that creates a unique experience. And of course, families outside of this can relate as well. And so it's not just immigrant families that deal with this, but I find a lot of immigrant families, there's a similarity between them. And so one of them is also a hierarchy. And so, with Asian families, they care a lot about respecting your elders. And it's about, you have to listen to your elders, not talk back to your elders. There's a term for it. I think it's called filial piety. Filial piety, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And so you're supposed to give back to you what your parents have given you. So Asian kids are more likely to be indebted to their parents. And so I know some of them who are paying off their parents' houses or or doing tasks for their parents. And that level of assistance that I don't see all families doing is what could separate some immigrant families from others. Another immigrant family struggle too is being proud and never saying sorry. So it's kind of like I had a billion items in my room and I had to move them all out. I didn't get any sorry or, oh, my bad from my family members. It's just yeah. like, I oh, deal with it. <laughs> and it's like, thank you. I Just what I needed this morning. It's a great way to wake up. That's why I'm fumbling over my words today, if anyone notices that. Yeah, you sound great. Don't worry. Yeah. You sound like the average NP. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. From my perspective, what it means to have immigrant parents, it's an experience. I'm one of seven kids. So I have a huge family. If you have more kids, you can work on the farm. Everyone will be happy because there's more people to rely on. Being an immigrant parent means a lot of things. It means being able to get away with a lot of things. For example, my parents, when I took them to second or third grade, take your parents to school day, they didn't know what my teachers were talking about. I had to translate to them. So at an early age, you had to learn how to be responsible for an adult. You had to learn how to be a translator for an adult. 
as a at a very young age you also have to learn how to call the mechanic you have to call like comcast or some type of like adult scenario and figure out how to navigate it as a child to communicate that to your parents as a child of an immigrant parent you also have to learn that there are so many systems in place within the united states or canada where they have assistance but they're unaware of it and when they hear about it, they're not even sure how to even approach it. We have to learn how to approach those assistants in order for them to even engage with that. Something about being an immigrant or being the child of an immigrant that most people are unaware of is the long lasting effect that it has for you to understand how to take care of people. Not only do you have to take care of yourself, you also have to take care of your like uh, parents. Not only do you have to take care of your parents, you have to take care of your grandparents if they migrated with you as well. Not only do you have to take care of them, your siblings, your cousins, there's a lot of communal bonding something that i've noticed in the mian community the mian ogs they don't trust people that aren't mian you know like they would much rather purchase from an asian person than from a white person a black person mexican indian or anything else because they have this understanding that hey they're asian we look alike we probably came from a similar background so i trust you and because of that sometimes they get scammed sometimes like shit happens to a point where we as the person that was born and understand the system that we're raised in the culture we have to fix that for them so there's a lot of implication when it comes down to having immigrant parents not only do you have to learn how to survive living a dual lifestyle code switching like what crystal said earlier having to understand that our parents aren't going to be like uncle phil and aunt viv from uh fresh prince of bel-air where they're comforting when you need comfort or they make sure that you aware that you're loved not only do you have to code switch when it comes down to the social to your social life you also have to do it at work too because like what joy said earlier you're taught to be very quiet you're taught to respect authority you can't respect authority if you want to make it in the corporate world you're supposed to speak your mind even if you're wrong as long as you have an idea it makes you seem like you're competent so it's just a lot of code switching and a lot of scenarios and I feel like I'm rambling, so please, one of you take it from here. <laughs> yeah, I think criticism is a huge part of the culture. And I think that it can be discouraging at times because it can make you feel like your parents don't believe in you. When I started my career as a YouTuber, the only question my mother has asked me about my job is, when is your business going to fail? And then that's mm. it. And that's her way of showing love, right? She's worrying about my business. And she's wondering if it's going to do well. And it's not a real job because you're not a doctor or a lawyer. So there are some of these current jobs that didn't exist before that aren't given any sort of legitimacy in the eyes of an Asian parent. There was this Harvard Business Review. They said that for every constructive comment you give, you need to have five positive interactions with a person for the ideal interaction. And I was like, man, I have zero compliments to a thousand insults with a, my kind of Asian parents. They're also toxic, so it's not just the fact that they're Asian too, they have some of those traits. And I find that it has really discouraged independence because some Asian parents can be very helicopter parent-y and nitpicky. And so when you're cooking or when you're trying to become an adult, they'll tell you all the ways that you're adulting wrong. It's like, oh, do it this way, this way. And it can, be like, well, I guess I'm never really enough for you. But that's not what they're trying to communicate. They just think they're truly helping you prepare for the world. So it comes from positive intentions that it's like, hey, if I just point out all the things wrong, then other people won't haze you for it then. So I'm giving you this so that you don't get it from the outside world. I want to add on to that real quick because I feel like that's a very specific thing for immigrant like children like we are that most people are unaware of that because we get criticism in a lot of things that we do we're afraid to take risks we are more prone to doing what's tried and true because at a very young age we were taught that the moment we speak up or, or the moment we deviate from whatever is the standard we can be reprimanded and reprimand means that it could be vocal or it could be physical but there will be some type of negative reinforcement that follows that makes you not want to take risks make that makes you not want to try something different or if you do take a risk or do something different you're not going to tell them because even if you're honest with them there's no there's no benefit to honesty yeah th that is true and so i think sometimes 
there's an immigrant culture of I need to assume you're bad at your core so I need to reprimand you into being good. Whereas I think a lot of North American messages are, you're a good person and let's lift you into your potential. Whereas I feel like Asian culture is more like, you're an inherently bad person or a person who needs to be controlled to become better. So I need to reprimand you. I need to get you in line through threats or like harsh wording and maybe even getting beat for some Asian kids, and that's for your own good. And so it, it, everything is done in the name of love that's not really love. It's like, let me say mean words to you in the name of love. Let me um, be harsh on you for the name of love. Let me compare you to your cousins in the name of love. And then Asian kids have a really skewed idea of what love is. Because of that, they're like, oh, uh, love so far has only been all these negative things. And then it makes you wonder if you can truly understand love if you've never really been loved by your parents in a way that's healthy. It's like, oh, am I am I broken for life? Like, can I, am I never going to be able to love people properly because I, I learned to associate love with all these painful things? And, and so for some Asian kids, it can create an existential crisis. Like you notice that you struggle when it comes to loving or being a functional human in some aspects and you wonder if it's going to be temporary or if you wonder it's going to be long lasting yeah that makes a lot of sense to me to share a little bit of what's been going on in my life i'm like currently unemployed because basically i have a situation ship relationship that ended very poorly in the summer and primarily with my dating life until recently I would date like Chinese guys and it wasn't even that my parents were telling me to or that they particularly care about what race I'm dating or anything but like a big part of like the themes of my life has been I've always wanted their validation and to be good enough. I also knew from a young age just based on how you know I guess exposure to like other people they realized early on that like I was never gonna be that cookie cutter person because I just wasn't that good at STEM, wasn't that good at like following social norms, and I just kind of knew I was going to be a huge disappointment to them. And that was really hard for me because I was like, I'm not probably going to anytime soon at this point in my life be able to like retire my parents and do all this stuff and be a good Asian kid. On the other hand, so many kids like I know are super mentally ill and all this stuff from like going through the motions of what it takes to be like a good Asian kid. And like, what if they paid for that? Like a lot in like emotional and mental health. So for me, early on, I really rejected the idea of like having a duty, but the reason my manner is so good is I always wanted to like maintain a psychological closeness with my parents. I knew early on that like if I'm the one translating the power dynamic is like on me because as I get older and I can't like they can't keep up with my English and I didn't do the work when I was a kid to do like to learn Chinese, I'm never going to be able to fully even have a chance at like asking them the questions and getting the answers as to like how they work. So I knew this as a really young child, which is why like I continuously like as a subconscious form of respect would only talk to my parents in Chinese completely. Like I don't speak any English at home and I've tried my best to translate a lot of things I think into Chinese to where people actually think I'm a native speaker, which is great and all, but that was like my one kind of token of like this respect for them because I already knew that like I'd have to raise myself in a way like emotionally because I needed a lot of emotional comforting and validation as a kid and I knew very early on my needs were not going to get met by both of my parents. They're both sensors. I mean they're both feelers but they're very pilled on this idea that I must be logical to like survive or whatever. And you know I can't really speak for your experience John necessarily and you know it is a, I do live in America so it's maybe a different place in Canada Joyce but I would say like a lot of like like for me I studied a lot of like how the cultural revolution really like shifted things socioeconomically and the context my parents grew up in because it doesn't feel like for me because I guess I have pretty strong FI I never feel like I'm making excuses to justify necessarily being mistreated because my mom's like super toxic but I began to figure out really early on a lot of like the standards she imposed on me were direct responses to like the trauma that she'd suffered or our, her family had suffered in the Cultural Revolution because my great-grandfather was actually a huge activist um, and journalist and all she grew up hearing about was 
what that costs a family. And so she was like, I don't know, she saw the kind of person I wanted to be and like my personality early on. And she was like, you can definitely do great things for society, but you are going to be a huge burden. You're going to suffer greatly for it and probably die mentally ill and young. And I hate that for you. And I'm like, all right, uh, I guess you see who I am, but you hate it. That's cool. So we just had this like, eternal rift where she, as an ISFJ especially, cannot fathom the way my life has like turned out. And as for me, like I knew early on, like after college, when I was in journalism school, I was a huge overachiever, and I realized that I was gonna burn out and probably not make it. Honestly, like I've always had a huge like pulse on my mental health, and I was like, I need to prioritize, like getting better at FE basically or getting better at my shadow. I found functions in college, so for me it was very much I need to like focus on the things that my parents feel like are luxuries, which to them is true community and like chosen family and like actual love. Because I feel like a lot of people talk about like a lot of like Asian immigrants at least talk about love as like a concept. Like they don't actually know what it is. They just kind of pay lip service to this thing that they don't really experience or they experience like the bare minimum tolerance of it. And I'm like like, it's, it's like saying, like, oh, I make, like, 25 to 30k a year, I'm so rich. It's like, no, you're not. Like, looking outside the box and being like, that's literally not true. And I feel very spiritually wealthy here in New York, even though I'm still working on, like, a career transition. I've really, like, let go of, like, a lot of, like, my preconceived notions. Okay, that's kind of a tangent. But back to, like, what I was saying about, like, in the summer I had the situation with this guy end. Um... That opened up, like, basically a can of worms around, like, attachment and how deeply I, you know, would, like, find, like, avoidant Asian guys and just really want their validation because of how avoided my parents were of giving me love. Like, and then I quit my really toxic job at a startup. And since then, like, it's like, I've not really prioritized trying to find a new career right away. I've been kind of, like, using my network and like kind of getting freelance things here and there and I feel really ashamed of myself but at the same time I also know that like there was no way in hell that I was going to be able to like heal fully from like reckoning with just how much my mom had abused me all these things if I didn't prioritize that and you know as a child of immigrants I just feel like it's all about like you just realize early on that you're on your own and you have to like you know, raise your par- you have to raise your parents here by translating, but on a deeper level, you have to like psychologically raise yourself. You have to tell yourself what a good life means. You have to mm-hmm. philosophically seize your own identity, seize your own um, moral compass, and you have to be willing to go against what your parents say because there comes a point where you realize that doing everything that they want or believe is right is actually harming you. And a lot of the times they are, you know, they're not evil people. They're just way too traumatized to be able to let go of, like, their security blankets because so much is risky. And also when you don't have access to the language, I think that's, like, a huge thing that continuously builds trauma. Like, literally, I think that not being able to make sense of the world because it's not just a culture, but the language is literally so different and how you make sense of that. Like... You know, like, I know some people with immigrant parents, but they came when they were, like, in their early teens. So they acclimated, assimilated so much easier. Um, Some people had, like, parents, but, like, they grew up speaking English. Like, even, like, things like that can, like, really shift how you conceive of a culture. So basically, you have to both grow up too fast, starved for your love and psychological needs, feeling this sense of indebtedness to your parents, but also the sense of, like, I'm sure that, like, especially as intuitives, we all get a sense of why our parents do what they do. And we don't necessarily get that sort of, like, discernment and, um, like, the f- that is a form of love, like, understanding someone. Like, I think also you get into type, honestly. It's like the self-selection factor of, like, you're even into type because you are so desperate to understand the world around you. I think Joyce and I made a video once about how I was saying, like, you know, I recognize TI as the first function I could comprehend because I didn't have it. It was like, finally, there's an answer for why my mom always thought I was dumb because she doesn't have TE, I don't have TI. And so it just like healed a lot of like misconceptions to where like, honestly, I can say that the motivating factor for like why I study psychology or anything. TI is your blind function too, right? As your Yeah, I, yeah I know I don't have it. So for me, because I have NE, I can see it everywhere around me. And, and I also know that I I don't have it so it's blind in myself yeah I can actually I can actually like 
everyday scenarios, I'll be like, wow, I've only had TI right now, because I can see everything around it, basically, except for the thing itself. So that's, like, how my life goes. Um, it's funny, because my mom actually, we slightly get along better now, because she actually got a little more into, like, astrology and psychology from, like, WeChat and stuff. But it's, like, 28 years too late, honestly, at this point. Um, anyways, that's, like, a huge little NEFI ramble about, like, how I feel like we bear extreme psychological burdens on this level that I feel like so many people don't comprehend just how weighty it all feels. Um, but I, this is what I spent all my time thinking about. I know I'm not going to get paid to think about this necessarily, um, but has made my relationships better, has made me more introspective because I... I don't think I forgive my parents necessarily. I feel like I'm still like, grieving that like I have to put up so many intense boundaries. Like I'm in New York for the holidays because I don't want to see them. Like it's it's rough. I think Crystal, you you put it brilliantly. You're starved on many basic levels, and so spiritually, emotionally, mentally starved. I feel like. I didn't really learn many true life lessons from my parents. It almost felt like life's livestock parenting. So it's like, yeah, you're given food and clothing, and then that's where it begins and that's where it ends. Like and I don't... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, I feel like a, a pet. <laughs> but I think pets get more love, because I think um, with <laughs> Asian yeah. culture... Yeah, like, Asian culture, it's almost like taboo to be too emotionally affectionate to other human beings or your family. So my mom is an ESFP. She's really nice to our cats and our dog, but to people, she can't give it the same love. But to strangers, she's super friendly. And so it almost feels like this two-facedness or this um, saving face. Like there's a pride culture in Asian culture where you look really good to other people but you treat your family like trash it's like oh everything's great I need to show other people how my life is totally yeah exactly well. and they're like, they're like never tell people what's going on at home that's so shameful I remember my mom did that so much as a kid and I was just like why it's the truth and she hated <laughs> me for that like I was like bro <laughs> yeah yeah so it, it almost feels like no one really actually cares about having a genuine relationship and it for some asian parents they can be very materialistic like um my parents they would be like hey we didn't save ten dollars on this thing joyce you need to argue two hours with this customer service person so we get our money back because they can't speak english that well so like you said john we take i take care of a lot of the translator roles and especially the oddball duties where i have to go to a store and now I have to argue on my mother's behalf for a discount she wanted and i'm like each hour of my time is worth one dollar <laughs> like it, it's, it's like saving minuscule amount of money and it's like, it's really the prioritization over objects and money over people. And you, you notice it time and time again, you, you feel kind of deprioritized as a human being. And you think it's so funny because it's like, man, if only you felt you fought as hard for our relationship as you do for this two dollars, man, that, it, it would be a really different story right now. Nelson Mandela has a very famous quote, hatred is when you drink poison and expect your enemy to die from it. That's kind of how it feels when you have self-hatred based off of your parents, something that you don't have control over. What you have to understand is they had influence to who you used to be, but they don't have as much influence as who you will be. If you start forgiving yourself, forgiving your flaws, forgiving the ways that you are approaching life based off of the way that you were treated or the way that you were raised, that's where real growth begins. Let's start talking about cognitive functions because this is an MBTI channel. Most of my family are extroverted feelings. Uh, ISFJs, ESFJs, and ISTP. I realized at a very early age that there were certain family members that I could connect with easier and there are certain family members that I couldn't connect with easier. I have an INFP older sister and an ESFP older brother. And I learned that one of the reasons why I don't live near my family anymore or live at home anymore is because I don't have anyone to help nurture my FI. Introverted feeling, for those of you who are unfamiliar, introverted feeling is just your value system and it's kind of your identity. When I try to express my FI to the FE users, it gets pushed under the rug. We, I get told that I'm ridiculous. I get told that I'm the odd one out. I get told that, hey, you shouldn't do this. You should do this instead. And 
it's okay in small bursts and it's okay when I have uh, my ESFP or INFP older siblings there because they would defend me. They would tell them like, hey, okay, we understand what we should be doing, but that's what he wants to do and he knows what's good for him. Once they were out of the picture, I didn't have that anymore. And because I didn't have that anymore, I left. And it doesn't make sense for me to go home because I feel like that's a very vicious culture to, to like it's vicious from a mindset. There's a point in my life where I try to TE my way into FE saying, okay, I will be very happy if I took care of my family because TE told me this is where my FI value is. And I realized that the longer that I was there, it felt like ingesting poison. I was slowly dying. My, my self-worth was being affected. The way that I was approaching life was being affected. I was in a very, very depressive state. I realized I resurrected myself like a fucking phoenix once I left. I love my family to death, but I can love them from a distance and they won't change anything for me. And it's actually better for me. Brilliant show, John. And so how my type shows up in my family dynamic is that I'm an INFJ and with extroverted feeling, there isn't much FE in my household. So there are two kinds of immigrant Asian households. There's the SFJ household and the STJ household. I got the STJ mentality households. So there was no checking in to see the relational dynamic. My parents have actually never asked me, how are you, my entire life. Like, they do not know anything about my life. They have not shared anything about their life in, in some strange way. So it's like, this interesting silent culture. It's like if your whole house was a library with the odd insult every so often, but otherwise silent and you guys don't really talk. It's That was kind of my experience. My love language is words of affirmation in the five love languages. And so that was not really in my household. And so I found that Asian families from a long time ago, they're like from a super sensory culture. So I find like ESFPs or ISTJs from 50 or 60 years ago are super S. Like they, they hit the far end of sensing, like talk about concrete things all the time, no abstraction. Whereas right now we live in intuitive culture. So people tend to talk more about concepts and abstractions no matter what their type is. And so I find that my parents type were super, super obvious because of that that element. And that also creates a bigger rift too because all they'll talk about is real things and that would make for a very excruciating two hours if you were to sit with them and they're like, here are the deals at Costco and then the next sensory topic and then the next one and it's like, but what about any deep conversation? Um, where, yeah, so I, I find some of the ways my type can clash with the culture is that um, with my NF-ness. So a lot of NFs, they care about social justice in different ways. And so I, I think this is also millennial culture too. And so a lot of immigrant Asian families can be a little bit racist or a lot racist, depending on the family Let's you're from. Real. They're very racist. Asian people are some of the racist <laughs> people in the world. <laughs> yeah, they'll call your friend by their least favorite uh, feature on their face and by their necessity <laughs> yeah so, oh how's your big nosed brown friend <laughs> and that's like oh right that's how you identify my friends that's great <laughs> mm. the thing is my parents are super racist in certain ways so when i have a indian friend come over they'll like lock the doors to make sure that it's not nothing's being stolen and i'm like yep. that is so racist <laughs> and I, I i laugh because it's so absurd it's like all you can do is really laugh about it but then it creates this cultural divide where it's kind of if you're not racist but your parents are kind of racist it creates this awkwardness where it's like ah i guess that's that's difference <laughs> right there but um a lot of asian people don't think mental health exists so if you're depressed if you're anxious that doesn't exist they only see your productivity so it's like you're not moving towards reaching a milestone in life you're not getting married, or, and they'll remind you every so often, get married, get married, please get married. <laughs> and it's like, well, what about greater things in life, like my happiness or my peace as an individual? And it's like, but did you put a ring on it? <laughs> and so you feel an urgency to meet milestones, and then you feel different, noticeably. And so it's hard to bond over with your, to bond with your parents when you have a different 
set of beliefs and that they pressure you to get married or to have a certain job by a certain time. It feels like every time you talk with them, you don't know if they're going to mention if you should do that milestone yet. And you're like, I'm just going to avoid all of that by avoiding them for now. And I think that crashes with the NF-ness because NFs tend to be very into creating a world where everyone's potential is being met. And it feels like if you're put into this tried and true box, it really stifles your maximum human potential. That makes sense. It's been actually, you know, full transparency, really hard to do uh, job apps as well because I'm just so anxious all the time because all I hear about my mom is my mom. Like, because, you know, like when you grow up, you still hear their voice, even if you're physically far away from them, which is why I'm like, this will always haunt me. Like, what the heck? So... I just hear her being like, you're so impractical, you're such a burden, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right, let's go die then. Like, as a kid, I was just like, all right, my mom hates me because I suck. And it's like, dude, that's so sad growing up like that. Um, but yeah, I'm really grateful that I found a community in New York that I do feel like accepts me because it's a pretty hard one for me to trust people, but I'm in a good place for that now. That being said, I am worried about like, what I'm going to do for work and all this stuff. And I have like such anxiety about like being like a deadbeat as they call it. But I've let go of all that for now. And I'm really proud that like me through all that, I managed to like really like stop feeling so bad on myself constantly. Cause I feel like I could have gone down a pretty bad path several times in my life, but I really worked through it. So that's why I'm like, well, even if it's not real to them, mental health is very real to me. And you know, like, my mom only started taking it seriously once, like, a couple people in our community actually, like, took their own lives and, like, or, like, had schizophrenic breakdowns and have to, like, take meds and, like, it's all this stuff. So she's like, oh, maybe this is actually not a good environment. And I'm like, took you long enough. <laughs> I mean, I never say it that way, but it's like, yeah. And, you know, not everyone's parents, you know, come to see the light about that kind of thing. But I really don't blame anyone for you know, feeling that way going through that yeah I, I think the worst approach you could do is blame your parents for the way that they were raised and how they were taught because mm -hmm. it, it's resources they we receive certain resources that didn't have we we're taught to look at things have a vision that they weren't aware of even aware of i know you mentioned like introverted thinking that got you into myers briggs is there any understanding of cognitive functions that is being implemented to improve your relationship with your family? My journey is, yeah, I've been studying functions for like 10 years now, basically, almost nine-ish years. And I would say like a general understanding of how, not just like how I struggle with, but like a conscious way I have tried to learn about the functions I don't use through close friends that also understand type um, through my life experiences and reflecting on the things I don't like doing and using it as a map to like figure out how to do it. I feel like I've actually improved my internal boundaries with my parents because a lot of it's like, I think I'm pretty good at verbally setting boundaries with TE, but I'm very bad at like internally not letting what they say influence me on the super level, intense level. And I think this is like transcendent of what kind of like t functions you have. Like, I actually have a really close friend who is ESTP, and he is, like, a genius, like, you know, like, um, went to Penn for undergrad, and, like, went to Princeton and got a master's in ML, and, like, is a super good at, like, neuroscience, physics, all this stuff, and, yeah, just, like, kind of, like, seeing how he detaches, not trying to literally copy his way of detaching, but, like, getting an insight and look at, like, how he reasons through understanding what's going on when his parents or anyone pisses him off you know on the other hand he like doesn't necessarily have to deal with the fi that's in the way but i feel like it's like talking to different people about my trauma but also talking to them about how they live their lives and how they work through different complex problems has helped me grow my own ti my own fe my own ni and se like everyone to me is like someone i can learn from and so I think that has translated to having more patience is that, is that with any, myself. Is that extroverted intuition, what, what you're talking about right now? You're learning from other people's, the, the way that they're engaging with it? I 
I'd, I'd say so. I think having, I think it's my instinct for sure. Um, I'm very protective of my FI, but like I've always known because I primarily lead with NE that the only way to, you know, DIY my way through things is to like train. Because I think of like for me, like all the introverted functions are like LLMs. You know, you basically they're algorithms. You have to train them. So my SI has like this diet of like all this terrible talk and this twisted worldview, my parents were just villainizing them is quite frankly they have very bad beliefs about things that I knew weren't true. I didn't know what the correct beliefs were. So it's about like feeding myself a diet of like new experiences, new types of friends, new types of ways of thinking and like training that until I can also learn to discern what feels true to me. Just kind of like stimulating myself with that. Um, and that has really helped. Like, uh, I would say I'm much more discerning about what I think and what I believe. Just not natural for an ENFP, because I feel like I'm very good at, like, emotional discernment. Like, I'm very good at, like, knowing who I trust, who I want to be around, who I feel safe with. That's totally natural. But I'm not good at, like, like, you know, really rooting in my worldview and things that I believe that no one can shift, even if they give me a lot of, like, compelling evidence which is really hard with TEFI. Um, I think that over time, I have learned how to do that, and that has been, I don't let my parents' worldview like poison me as much now because I've had enough ample experience building my own worldview. So the best advice I can give to like most kids of immigrants is like live your own life on your own terms and be prepared to have to like grow up faster than you want to to like truly separate from your parents because it's, it's deep enmeshment. You know, like, a lot of collectivism is that. And what I want to say is a lot of, like, immigrant parents' mentality isn't necessarily reminiscent of Asian culture as it is today. If you go back to Asia, like, a lot of their ideas are very outdated from a time where, you know, it was, like, a law of the land and, like, the trauma of living under oppression. But, you know, if your country, your Asian country has modernized and shifted a lot in the last, like, you know, 30 years or something... People there have such a different worldview. Like, people from the mainland who are, like, my age who come to America and, like, hang out with my parents literally cannot connect with them either. Um, yeah. And they're, like, their values are really twisted and, like, you know, um, it's just super different. So I think of it as they're a time capsule of a really traumatic time in, you know, turn of the century uh, politics. And this is not reminiscent of how I'm going to see Asia or how I'm even going to see who they really are beneath all that trauma. I have to go and create my own story and be okay radically with the fact that I'm going to live with this grief, but at the same time, there's so many outlets for healing it that I've exposed myself to. I guess it's a, having NE, and not everyone with NE is this way, obviously. Like, a lot of ENFPs I know who are Asian immigrants get trapped into the, you know, quicksand of trying to conform and feel very traumatized and have no idea how to make sense of it. And, you know, also this culture is so fixated on like being a thinker but I always knew early on that I was not a thinker like there was no way in hell I would have ever mistaken myself for that I'm like I'm not logical I really struggle with logic I want someone to tell me what I think constantly and I I think I developed being more logical and balanced without it ever being an identity fixture the way I think a lot of Asians actually try to identify with being logical so a lot of them test as T's as I noticed but for me I was just like very like all I have is my humility and my curiosity, and I will use that as a way to create a life for myself. I think with MBTI, it's really helped me with understanding my type and how it contrasts with my family and has given me a lot of closure with things that I haven't previously. Like, let's say with dominant introverted intuition, I, I've... I know that about myself, intimacy is not just food or it's not just shelter or it's not just convenience. Like, when it comes to Asian families, we kind of, or when it comes to my family, it tends to be more of a superficial bonding over um, lunar holiday or other things where we're not really getting to know each other's minds. And I think with dominant introverted intuition or being an intuitive in general, you actually feel intimacy by someone understanding your mental landscape or mm -hmm. your mind and how you process things, your thoughts. 
about the world and how you concluded that the ecosystem of your worldview like when someone gets to know that and what makes you tick that's intimacy and so it feels like the most core component of intimacy wasn't there but what that helped me was is now i know how to build a family of my own um words that are really great are fictive kin they use this to describe animals that like let's say a lion adopts a kitten as one of their own that's called a fictive kin because they're not naturally family but this is your fictional family and so I have my chosen family now and I do feel like I have people in my life who want to understand my thoughts about the world or engage with me mentally because that's a form of nutrition for me like when I'm able to have a riveting conversation with someone that really gets to the heart or crux of something or we're just able to have like a good exchange of 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 minds of souls of hearts or something more conceptual right we're, we're exchanging maybe our hopes or dreams or aspirations or just us being human with each other where i i feel like there's a f formality to asian culture that prevents that intimacy from growing and so um a lot of my life um has been looking for those people who can connect with the dominant and i so that there is connection finally in my life until i was 26 i didn't really feel like i experienced human dignity like i felt like i experienced human dignity in the form of people being nice to me but i never felt like people really gave dignity to the deepest parts of me until now in my life and i think it's because i understood type and understanding type helped me find people who will understand and see you more seamlessly there's the oh find people who speak your language so you don't spend a lifetime translating your soul and so that's the being an ni dominant you're already a very small percentage of the population and it's nice to find a home in the world and so i feel like because i found mbti i was able to find my real life home too so it's it's almost like if you have one safe space that one space that one safe space ripples outwards and it expands in scope and so i felt like over time this this place where i can call home became a mansion became a city became a province and so i've types really helped with that because i could identify it and then once you can name it you can claim it and so I, I thought i was really able to do that with my life i think with extroverted feeling how i've applied that to type is i noticed that when it comes to social niceties uh, from a young age, I, I taught myself please and thank yous because I just wanted people to feel good. And I'm like, oh, you know, that would help give people the message that they matter. And so it's a good form of social communication in that you can translate value to another person. And so I feel like I have this idea of how people should treat each other. And so I think sometimes when my STJ family upbringing can go against how people should treat each other. I'm like, hmm, you're violating this external, this external standard of how I think people should treat each other. And so there can be that F-E and S-I-T-E clash there too. Um, when it comes to T-I, sometimes, or this could be the being an intuitive too. When you notice your parent having bad behavior, there might be a desire to, I don't want to reward this bad behavior, so I'm going to try to circumvent it. And it can be seen as, or just a, it can be seen as millennial not listening to their parents, being rebellious, when you're really just trying to not reward bad behavior. And you notice that your parent is actually doing something that is a cycle that is harmful. I realized that trying to TI challenge my ESFP mother doesn't work, and that's what type helped me with. Like, I would try to explain to my mother the logic behind why she should not say certain things. And I realized the only way to reach my mother was to use the same nastiness towards her. So her, her My actual... mom's like that, too. Even though she's an ISFJ, my mom is like that, too. She will only listen if you're harsh with her. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, the, the only time I was able to make my mother not be negative was she told me, when is your business failing? And then I said, when are you dying? Cause I, oh and I said that God. because- <laughs> Dude, yes. 
Ooh, that was rough. The reason why I said that is I know she has something against dying because she's this happy ESFP Enneagram 7 or Enneagram 6. And she hates any negative topic. She hates the talk of death. And so I'm like, this is a weak spot. This is this goes against my my FE. Like I wouldn't want to do this. But I've never tried this strategy. So why, why don't I try it? And and it worked. Like that was the only time I, w- I was able to shut her up. And I was like, wow. So I can't reason with her. I really just have to use her fire and then and then direct it back to her because it's the I language. I was like that too. Like, yeah. literally, she'll be like, I don't want you to go. I'm like, okay, I'm not going then. Like, so it'd be like, no, please, let me go. Like, she wanted me to, like, beg for her for things, and I'd be like, like, just being, like, apathetic. So then she would try to, like, take shots at me, but, like, that's the only way she stops. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't I can't do this. <laughs> mm, yeah, but I'm not a horrible person. I didn't say it because I meant <laughs> to make her feel- Oh, no, yeah. We get it. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you resort to the the nastiest tools in your toolbox when you're trying to figure out what works. You're like, all right, I guess this is the only thing. And uh, I guess with extroverted sensing being last, there is this impracticality. So with Crystal, she's also sensing last too in her stack. And we can look impractical, unsensible, and not realistic in the eyes of sensing parents. So that can really cause a rift. And um, learning MBTI helped me because then I'm like, I can just use language to make myself look successful or I can use language that looks realistic and sensible to an Asian parent. So it's like I got better at presenting the specific part they want to hear and then that's it. (laughs) So we're at the end of our video. I want to make sure that both of you have an opportunity for any closing statements. Um, anything that you guys want to say before we leave? Feel free to like oh, and subscribe. Good. Oh yeah, um, I need to go back to making videos, but I will hopefully be coming back soon. So feel free to like and subscribe when that time comes. Thank you both of you for being on this uh, video. I think it's very helpful. I know that when I was searching for type, when I started about like a decade ago as well, that I wish this video was available. So I'm sure we're making someone's day that they know that they're being heard. Um, yeah, thank you again, both of you. I'll talk to you later. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.